That meeting started off a half an hour for church with a 50-piece or more silver band. Then you got two big choirs, one on each side, and a song service. They would almost make your hair stand on it. I mean, that thing would just rock. And then, over on the side, Sister McPherson would walk down a long, there was a long ramp that led down to the platform. She used to carry a bouquet of roses, huge bouquet of roses, and she walked to the platform and walked out, and I thought, that's the most beautiful woman I ever saw in my life. It was the height of the Roaring Twenties, and Los Angeles was a sprawling boom town. Cars clogged the roads, oil rigs dotted the landscape, housing subdivisions sprouted in the middle of bean fields. The movie industry accentuated the prevalent Roaring Twenties atmosphere of fast living. And only a ruin and a heartbreak and a homebreak lay in the direction of backsliding. Amy spoke out against this wide-open living, but she also tried to replace its tempting diversions with her own. She held her audience transfixed for hours each Sunday with a display of music and song. But the centerpiece was her illustrated sermon, a biblical or topical story she would tell with the aid of elaborate sets and costumes. She wrote music to go with her sermons, hymns and musical pageants and sacred operas. Every week, she held a faith healing service. Ambulances would line up on the street as dozens of the ill and disabled arrived in wheelchairs, on crutches, and on stretchers. Many scoffed and branded Amy a charlatan, but those who believed became unswerving followers. And I'll never forget my first miracle, the first miracle I saw. This lady, rather large lady, but she came to the platform. She had a huge goiter that just hung down profusely. And um, when uh, Amy Simple McPherson prayed for her, that goiter completely disappeared. I saw it before my eyes. Amy's magnetic appeal also attracted the curious. Then, as members of other churches defected to Amy's, ministers began to see her as a threat. Her chief rival was the popular Bob Schuller, a fierce hellfire and brimstone Methodist preacher. Fighting Bob published an entire pamphlet condemning Amy's flamboyant preaching. He called her a fraud, a she-wolf in sheep's clothing, but one, he said, who was the greatest advertising genius and publicity specialist on the earth. We thought, she shouldn't take that. That's not the truth, what he's saying. But she would just get up and she'd say, let's pray for Dr. Bob, you know, let's pray for him. Fighting Bob had won much of his success by playing upon the insecurities and ugly prejudices of his time, launching virulent attacks against Catholics and Jews. Amy welcomed all people, regardless of their race or faith. Newly arrived Angelinos especially embraced her joyous message. Renewed health and prosperity in this life, as well as salvation in the next. Her soothing words set her apart from other evangelists of the time, who emphasized guilt, fear, and denial. She knows how to be compassionate with people because she was crushed and bruised and heartbroken. She was a woman who just ran over with compassion. Do you live in the castle of broken dreams where giant despair and his dark routines are your fabrics of life torn and tattered? She you... called her congregation the Church of the Four Square Gospel and she created a community around it, a home for all the lost, battered, displaced souls, like herself. When you joined Angela's Temple, you didn't just sign the register and sit in your, in your pew Sunday after Sunday. You were required to do something. You joined a family, you joined a team. You signed a card that said, I'll sing in the choir. I'll teach Sunday school. 
our visitors sick. But everybody believed that they were somebody important and somebody of service. We would get out and march up and down the local streets. We'd get flags and probably wear our white uniform dresses or... Now this involved maybe up to two or three hundred children. And we would end up at Sister McPherson's home and we'd stand there and sing, We Are McPherson's Boys and Girls, until she would come out on the balcony and give us some love, you know, and, and throw kisses to us and talk to us. Amy's devoted community filled the 5,300 seats of Angelus Temple three times every Sunday. Amy reached beyond the walls of her temple, becoming the first media evangelist with her radio station, KFSG. And when those shining silver towers were lifted up above our temple dome and flashed the message east, west, north, and south, our opportunity and privilege was broadened by hundreds of thousands of people. She helped the city of Los Angeles in that respect because many good men got into office because of the radio. And they knew that if they appeared on her program that they would get a lot of votes too. She was very influential. Amy's church services became a major Los Angeles tourist attraction. Her public image glittered like that of a movie star, complete with high-powered cars and glamorous clothes. I thought it was magnificent. Oh, I thought it was classy. Some people didn't think uh, a minister ought to have it that way, but, but we liked it. We think she just looked beautiful. Her dramatic flair and personal charisma won her broader, more popular forums. Sometimes she even shared billing with her Hollywood neighbors, who often visited her services incognito. Just down the road, there were several movie studios. Sometimes the, right out in the middle of the boulevard, there would be a movie scene going on. Adept at media manipulation, Amy began to feel herself above reproach, a celebrity adored by her public. Then, at the height of her success, Amy's shining world came crashing down as she became embroiled in a Hollywood-style scandal that titillated the entire nation. Disappearing from a crowded public beach one afternoon in 1926, she was believed to have drowned. Hundreds helped search for her and two men died in the turbulent waters. It's a very tragic part of our lives, of course. What would happen to anybody who, who, who had lost a mother? You were frightened, bewildered, beset. Reporters hanging on the door, everybody sending condolences, everybody talking about it and starting to say, your mother is, and then changing the word to the, to the word was. One month later, Amy suddenly reappeared. She elaborately recounted her escape from a band of kidnappers who had held her captive in Mexico. But evidence began to turn up that cast doubt on her story. Witnesses claimed they'd seen Amy in a romantic tryst in Carmel, California with a married man, her former radio station engineer, Kenneth Ormiston. Amy's critics were quick to attack. Reverend Bob Schuller wrote a new, scathing 64-page pamphlet that challenged Amy's kidnapping story as total absurdity and concluded, surely the stain of her sin is the deepest that has ever blackened the pages of history. The public devoured her story. The press insinuated that she was guilty by stressing her beauty, sensuality, and unmarried status. The district attorney mounted an investigation. He threatened to charge Amy with conspiracy to produce false testimony. They had nothing. She was innocent. And I might say this never bothered the church. If anything, it pulled the church together. <laughs>